You know what's crazy is that we're on Human Factors Cast episode 30. We have a fantastic show for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about all the stuff in Human Factors news, as per usual. And we're going to play some Human Factors 20 questions and talk about uh, this amazing achievement that is, what, 30, 30 weeks? I don't know. Anyway, Human Factors Cast starts right now. Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Billy Hall. Feeling fresh and fancy free. And Mr. Blake Arnsdorf is on the line, too. Oh, yeah. Coming at you from the ATL. There he is. You guys, this is episode 30. Holy moly. Wow. That's like three decades of podcasts. If we did one a year. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been this doing is, one this a is year. Yeah, this is your annual Human Factors podcast. No, I think the, um, I think the actual HFES uh, group puts out a podcast every year that talks about like what kind of shows uh, are, or, or um, events are going to be at HFES annually, so uh, so they probably got us beaten number of years, but I bet you we got them beaten number of episodes. Not like this is a competition or anything, but totally. Oh, but you know we're going to be doing their podcast for them next year, right? Ooh, oh yeah, this man, year. We'll ask them about that. We'll do it for free. I mean, how cool would it be to do uh, Human Factors Cast live from HFES, where we're actually on a stage doing the news or something? I don't know. It'd be cool. I'd be it's totally coming, down man. for that idea. I think we should try to shoot to see if they'll do that podcast where we talk about everything. I don't know. What do, what do our listeners think? If you guys like this idea, send an email to HFES, the folks behind organizing all that stuff, and let them know you want to see Human Factors cast on the stage there. Uh, you, can, you can visit us and all that stuff. It'd be fun. All right. But we are here to talk about the Human Factors news. Right, so this is the part of the show right. that's all about Human Factors news. Now, this could be anything from VR, automation, psychology, design, you name it. it. As long as it relates to human factors or the field of human factors, we're going to talk about it on the show. Blake, you're reading the news stories today. What's up first? All right, let's hop on into it. So we have one percent of the population. So it's about like seventy million people that are that are blind. So for a lot of companies, that's not a huge number when you think in terms of a potential use case for like a prop. It's massive to consider when there are only a few assistive technologies available to aid and to make people's lives of the visually impaired easier. So a new startup that spun out of an Oxford Oxford last year called Oxsight is looking to make that change. So the company is built and is testing augmented, augmented reality glasses to help the visually impaired recognize and navigate objects in their environment. So thinking of it as literally for the blind. Wait a minute. Are you telling me there are a pair of glasses that will give me telekinesis? So I got really excited when I read this at first. This is exciting. If you dive, a little, if you dive into the article a little more, it's kind of misleading, especially talking about this is like for the blind. Mm-hmm. Um, because all of their were having not blind people. Right. It was, um, it was um, people with low low vision, right? They were visually impaired. Still, yeah, which is still a really big deal, and it's a giant leap forward. But, I mean, all they were doing was invented reality set of glasses were outlining major objects, so like humans or people, big things, kind of, and they related to how you do it in video games. The way uh, I under- specifically blind people. The way I understood it, they, they basically took these augmented and increased the contrast way up. So you can see basically black white version of virtual reality. And so... Um, you know, this this contrast allows the visually impaired to basically navigate their environment in a way that they normally wouldn't be able to. A question real quick about this, though. Is this like some weird form of ecu- echolocation? No, echolocation? Room to them? No, echolocation uses audio. So, I mean, I mean, it's where you the environment to location. But this is, no, this is literally just taking an image and increasing the contrast and then putting it over their their eyes so it's kind of like 
type of thing. Kind of. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these people with diminishing glasses, like, it makes sense that they wouldn't be able to use it necessarily on people who are blind because uh, how would they be able to tell like a picture of a table from an actual table? Yeah, I mean, how would they even know what these things represented? It would just be like objects in space to them. Right. Ooh, I like that. New sci-fi channel. Objects, objects in space. <laughs> space. Space, 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 space. Okay. Still a pretty cool story. And still can hit a lot of people. So I don't know. It's cool. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I think that would be a cool idea. Plus cyborgs. Yeah, this is this is cool, happen. you guys. This is cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Billy, I'm really glad you jumped in and stopped us from doing it this time. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when, when we get ocular implants that interface with our uh, eye nerves and we can see more than just uh, the visual spectrum. We can see ultralight we, or ultraviolet. We can see uh, microwaves. I mean, that would open up the world of possibilities for uh, relaying information to the human operator. But anyway... Uh, well, I guess you could maybe do that with this, right? You could probably... Anyway, okay, okay. I'm getting too... It's a stepping stone. It's a yeah, stepping stone. Yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting right. too crazy. All right, Blake, what's what's up next, buddy? All right. So this one's on the scary front. So the message, missile inbound, seek shelter immediately, took over the screen. 52nd flight wing at... I'm going to mess this one up. Come on, come on. You could do it. All right, Spanglehem Lem Air Base? Yeah, in Germany earlier this week. So it was accidentally sent out to all terminals through the bases at as an ad hoc emergency alert system that is typically used for weather updates. That's kind of interesting. Oops. So sp- <laughs> spokesman Major Brian McGarry told Stars and Stripes, which is just another news outlet, one of the command post controllers was building a template for this specific thing, so I guess a missing missile inbound template that was posted. The message was intended to only to go out to one person, but <laughs> human error here. He inadvertently sent it to everybody, so he just decided to copy everybody on that email. Oops. <laughs> uh, so eight minutes after the message announcing impending doom popped up, a suit. Green went out across the base's terminal telling everyone to chill out. Everything's all good. I think the best part is they just gave him a blue screen and said, hey, it's okay. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. We're all good here. Everything checks out. Uh, we're good. How are you? By the way, <laughs> it's uh, pronounced Spangdalham. There we go. Spangdalham. It well, so- Germany- German always sounds like you're clearing your throat. I, I was really hoping that it was some... or something like that it accidentally went to all the screens or something <laughs> <laughs> well i was really hoping the smiley face was actually a part of the template that you right. see just to try and make you feel better <laughs> kind of like a fight club scenario <laughs> i just want to know how this happens this is this is why you don't reply all on an email like <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of funny because obviously they have it set up so you like either you check a box or you click a button that says send to everybody or only just one and- right I guess it's bad enough of an interface that they sent it to everyone. Right. Well, I That's mean, a misclick right there. Yeah, the trouble is that you always have to balance between making it easily accessible and also, you know, because in a, in a panic situation, you don't want to have to get to it um, by doing a long route. You want to alert everybody right off the bat. But then you also have, like, you don't want to make it too easy to where something like this could happen. Um I'm always a fan of those fail safe switches where you have to like lift up the glass and then press the big red button or like the key, then the glass, then the button because it's a triple fail safe uh, and you're not going to hit that button accidentally, but it's still easy enough. It's only two steps to get in. You know what I mean? Well, I would imagine that they would have like automated alarm systems for an incoming attack or something like that, like in a perimeter, right? Uh, you would think so. The, yeah, I would be like a lot of people probably looked at that thing Thing and, and we're just confused by it because usually it's like a big bunch of glary noises and then followed by explosions. I almost Crazy feel like stuff. I should have had sound Absolutely. effects for this one. Explosion! <laughs> the klaxon. <laughs> boom, ba- boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Hang on. It's not too late. Let's get some sound effects in here. All right. You guys keep discussing this. Well, I mean, like. I want to see the, the blue screen that told everybody to chill out. 
I don't think it actually said chill out on there. I think it it would be. Everybody be, take chill out. out. Sorry, we talking. management has made a mistake. Uh, For the missile, it's all good. It's all good. Just pick Cheech and Chong. Say, hey, can everybody get home? Yes. Yeah. No. Perfection. Um, can you being this guy though? You you are the guy who is on alert for at least five minutes. Oh but yeah. You, you are now. I mean, I, 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 California, I'm next to Pendleton. So I've known a lot of Marines and other people all over the place. So I'm thinking to myself, man, they must give him no amount of crap for that. Like, for every, sure, yeah. Every time he opened locker, it's probably a little red siren that goes. Mur, mur, mur. <laughs> all right, I'm taking a chance on the YouTube video. Let's see. Oh, no. I, I know. <laughs> All right, let's see what it gives. He shuts his, his bunker. You got a bunker with the lights and everything. I just have to hear this horn. I have to hear this horn. All right, where is it? Can you get the sound? I know. Right. So much it to be close to the pitch. Oh, I see. Ah! The red siren. There it is. Yes. Oh, my God. It's all right. Okay. Like, do you want to tell him that we didn't hear it? No. <laughs> I know you guys didn't hear it because I have. For, for okay, so hang on. For the people who are listening, uh, for podcasters, we have a min max setup, so way I can capture Billy and Blake's audio from my computer without actually them hearing themselves. So I played it on Thank the computer goodness. that they're coming from, so they didn't hear that sound either. That's just a little uh, behind the scenes little nugget for our listeners. All right, Blake. I didn't even know that. I'm excited. We, uh, we spent some time on this. What's up next? This is not good. Jesus. All right, so so this is insane, but this is probably my favorite story of the week. Drone heavy week. But so what happens <laughs> when your power lines get all kinds of trash hanging from them? One, how does it even get there? And it's not safe to send a human? Well, and I looked this up earlier. In Zing Yang, China, you send a drone. Yeah. Specifically drones that shoot fire. Yes, that's right. Fire spitting drones are being used by an electric power maintenance company in China to get rid of plastic bags and other debris. Again, how that stuff gets up there, I don't know. But they're being used to get rid of that in places that are hard for a human to reach using a cherry picker. This is wonderful, and I'll tell you why. So there's a couple things that I worked on that kind of speak to this. So one, I worked at a company that manufactured electrical relays and the amount of voltage that goes through those things is insane. It obviously kill you no matter what, like if, if you know the the electricity discharged. Um, So there's that aspect of it. But another aspect that you might not be familiar with is that uh, believe it or not, more accidents happen from employees falling whether it be in the facilities themselves or uh, off a cherry picker, more accidents from falling. And so this is really good that they're just replacing the human with drones in this case. Of course, but it looks insane if you look at the pictures for it, where it's literally just a big thing of fire coming from, I don't know, it's it's scary to look at the same time that saves a human. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I mean, I that they can shoot these little gust lanes and it doesn't matter, or is everything so recycled and up in no busy business? How does that work? I mean, yeah, I, yeah I was thinking it was going to char the cables so that it, you could only do it a couple times before you stop. No, 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 no. Cables are they have to protect from nature? They have to protect. It, they have to. Protect from, <laughs> those things are thick, and so yeah, there is that that. Um, pictures now there is that concern but uh, if it's just one piece the chance of that piece that exact piece of water be exposed to another piece unless it launches but then they wouldn't use it because then it would be near a tree they would it's a fire hazard um but yeah uh when can i get a flame through awesome they already have that shoot that under gun in that drone yes yeah no (laughs) there was a it's pretty hard it yeah all right uh blake what's up next gotcha so, have how Facebook likes all the data to feed you comp that presumes you'll like it. Choose not to think about it. Okay. It's, it's a little scary. Anyway, so now there's an app for your question, a data selfie that's an open Chrome extension that helps you discover how machine learning algorithms track your pro- 
track and process your Facebook activity to gain sites, finality, and habits. Didn't um, didn't everything talk about that idea? Look how face how basically we're technically paying with our time and our to have a Facebook account it's not necessarily. That makes sense. I mean, if you're yeah, <laughs> yeah, what you uh, what you don't pay like, for in 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 app purchases or whatever you're paying for with your time and loyalty to right. a and your data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, that's pretty cool, though. I would like to see what that algorithm looks like because I know Amazon's really good at, like, showing me things I had already looked up on Amazon, but sometimes it'll show me things I haven't looked up before, and I'm like, oh, that's really kind of cool. And then I find out that I'm going farther and farther down that rabbit hole of the Internet. You buy this you piece know? of podcast equipment. Would you like to buy these ones to make that one work? Yeah, right? That's the thing. I think that... I don't know. We're trading in a little bit of privacy of what we do on a computer for convenience, though. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, how much... Well, this is a whole other argument, but, like, how much privacy do we actually have? I mean, I'm talking to you guys into a microphone right now, and people out there are listening to us. Uh, and when I'm not talking to you guys, I have an Amazon Echo in my house that is listening to me. And if the government so chooses, they can tap into that and listen at any time they want. And well, our, too, if you use an Android phone, uh, the Google features or whatever, it's always listening and it picks up hot keywords even when you're not using like the voice feature. And you can go yeah. listen to that online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but guys, come on. It's just convenient. They don't do anything with this information. Right? Oh, yeah. I have no idea what they do or don't do. I think they do use it, but I don't think it's as malicious as your. Right. As my mind would tell me it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you also got to think about it this way. Someone has to listen to all that stuff. I mean, even if a machine just picks out keywords and things like that, someone it has to have a trickle-down well, effect, right? You would think that somebody listens to it, but really a machine parses that data, and, and that's when analysts come in and look at big data, right? So they'll, they'll look at what keywords were said. They'll, they'll look at my phone. They'll look at your phones and say, oh, Nick, Billy, and Blake were talking about privacy, uh, that was a theme of that conversation. We better take some of that away from them. <laughs> so, so then now Facebook will give me, you know, privacy ads. Like, do you want your privacy secured on the internet? And you know, click here. So that's how it works. But uh, they just kind of route it to the appropriate channels using big data. Oh, okay. Wait a minute, though. Should I be worried at the? Oh, dude, I've been downloading a lot of those dating site apps. That explains why so. <laughs> How many apps actually bring that up? Because I've been using that um that dating app you that we lonely? talked about last time. You know what I mean? Huh? Are you lonely? Yeah. No, no. it's yeah. there's a um <laughs> I forget, uh there there was a lawsuit with Target a couple years ago because uh a young woman was advertised to I think it was like a um it was contraceptives or, or diapers or something along that line. And this was a 16-year-old uh, young woman and, and her father. Oh, no, yeah, this story. Yeah, her father got really upset about this. Like, why are you advertising this stuff to my daughter? And it, it, it turns out that she had, you know, Googled stuff uh, about pregnancy and about uh, raising a child. And so Target just use that data and advertise to her and they had no idea that she was underage. And so I, I don't know what came of that lawsuit, but I know that was a thing. All right. Oh yeah. That was a really big That's deal. Really at some interesting. Point. Yeah. We yeah. are going down a rabbit hole here though. Let's talk about what's up next. I was going to say the first word, but uh, I'll let you take that. Well, I'll say it for you. Space. Uh, no, so the, the <laughs> space, 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 space. That was pretty good. <laughs> That was on, awesome, especially since there was no voice augmentation on that. Space! Space, 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 space. Pigs in space. <laughs> All right, so I, space. I, oh, space. Right. I can give you yeah, guys yeah. an echo, too. Hang on. Say space really quick. <laughs> space! Space! space. All, right. All right. All right. We're back. All right. Okay, so space. All right, so SpaceX successfully launched a Dragon spacecraft that is on its yeah! way to the International Space Station. Yeah, but this is the part that tripped me out. So SpaceX also successfully landed the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket at Cape Canaveral. So the Dragon spacecraft deployed its solar panels and is now on its 
is now going to orbit the Earth for a couple of days until it gets closer to the International Space Station, in which it will deliver a payload of approximately 5,500 pounds of supplies for astronauts currently in space. But the part that's not in the blurb here that's in the story is actually the Falcon 9, when it launched, it was what propelled the Dragon from like inside of some of its shell work into oh. space. And then the Dragon itself like let, pretty much launched from the Falcon 9. And then the Falcon 9 went on to go land somewhere else while the Dragon went into space. I thought that was just nuts. Have you there's well, a, there's a video of this and it is just unbelievable to watch how smooth it is. Elon Musk actually posted it on his uh, Instagram, and it's if I was Elon Musk, I'd do that. I I'm know, like, right? Look at this thing that I made. Uh, yeah, no, it's phenomenal to watch. Like it is just so smooth. They have this thing down packed. Like oh yeah, a science like a rocket science. Yeah, this yeah this is rocket science. Is that the show episode title? <laughs> this is rocket science, yeah, literally. <laughs> so. Um, no, that was, I, I, I watch all these things and I really dig them because, and I know I'm nerding out here for a minute, but I, I play a lot of, uh, Kerbal space program and I'm very bad at it. And, uh, I, I, it was hard to put a rocket into space. How hard it was for people to do that sort of thing. Yeah. Not only hard to put a rocket into space, but put, but shoot one rocket that shoots another one into space and then have one land. Right. It's beyond Hang fathomable on. sometimes. No. Really quick, guys, I have to apologize to our list because uh, Windows just did one of its jingles. All right, anyway, continue. <laughs> Lovely sounds of Windows. But yeah, no, I mean, what they're doing is so incredible. You know what I would really be interested in, though? If they actually st- came out next year and said, hey, we're going to start our own. You know, like I bet they could get enough money from different people over the world to act actually make their own space station you know another international space station that'd be amazing yeah and then you could have like space teslas and uh space teslas hang on do it one more time space teslas all right that was good all right (laughs) (laughs) oh man you guys will have to go back and listen to this because you can't hear yourselves all right what's up next All right, moving away from space. So this first-of-a-kind study used MRIs, so I think that's what, magnetic resonance imaging systems? You got it. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. No. (laughs) Google will save everybody's lives. Okay, so MRIs (laughs) to image the brains of infants, and then researchers used brain measurements and a computer algorithm to accurately predict autism, autism before symptoms set in. So the study shows that early brain development biomarkers could be very useful in identifying babies at the highest risk for autism before behavioral systems emerge. Uh, Wait a minute. Can you fix it then? No. I mean, that was kind of the tough part about this article. It's it's just that you're able to uh, identify it a lot lot earlier on. Um, Mm -hmm. Like instead of a lot of times people, kids are like between, I guess, two and four years old before they're ever diagnosed or somebody realizes they have autism or might. So uh-huh. the, the hope for this was that you just, you would catch it early on. And I know as, as time has progressed, different treatments and whatnot have been more successful for different types of autism. Right. Um, right. But no, it's not necessarily gonna mean that you're gonna be able to completely fix it. It's just identifying it earlier, kind of getting, getting past the hurdles you might encounter if you just didn't know it was coming. Well, and earlier treatment, oh. Earlier treatment, no matter what it is, will always help. Because there's a lot of development that goes on within the first two years of a child's life. And if they miss, you know, if they if they are not receiving treatment about that and then they get diagnosed when they're two years old, then, I mean, they missed out on those two years where all that development happened. So this is actually, this is really good for, you know, if they can... Really stage the development yeah. of a child? Yeah, so it won't get rid of autism, but it will definitely help. Okay. Yeah, okay. That, that'll be interesting to see, like if as they're able to identify it earlier, what their the children's lives will look like in like a longitudinal comparison between older adults and younger children with autism. Like if if catching it earlier actually helps, um, if you like implement these different treatments early on. That's well, it also makes cool sense for, for the side of the parents. The parents could take preparatory measures, start taking classes before the child is born. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of good things 
about that. And prepare themselves because I, I'd imagine that's a terrifying situation to be in. That must be really scary. Yeah, for the that, parents especially. That was a good article. Thanks for tossing that one in there, Blake. It's it's good to get back to our grassroots of psychology every now and then because uh, I feel like we focus a lot on human factors. This is human factors cast, but I mean we're we're grounded in the roots of psychology, and so it's always nice to get back to those roots. All right, what's up and next? Really doing some good work. Oh, all right. So kind of sticking in the medical realm, most people are aware that you can donate or organs when you die, right? right? But doing And doing so is very important. I mean, each deceased donor can save several lives if he or she donates their organs and tissue and they are used for transplantation. But organs aren't the only thing that you can donate once you're dead. What about do- donating your medical data? So data might not seem important in the way that organs are, but medical research cannot take place without medical data. And so the sad fact that most people's medical data is inaccessible for research once they are dead. And this is something I didn't know. I didn't know that you, like, when you die, access to any of your medical records or even your private information is kind of, like, wiped off from being accessible. Yeah, so... Well, that kind of makes sense because you're leaving your family behind. I mean, you know, if you had some sort of weird thing about you that you didn't want other people knowing about or some psychological or something along those lines, you don't want your family to hear about it and stuff like that. I think I mean, you don't want your family to have to um, deal with people knowing that stuff and everything. Right. I think uh, I think it's actually like 70, 72 years before it becomes um, part of the common domain. Uh, as nerdy as this is, though, like this is a real uh, problem in ethics right now, especially I'm going to I'm going to make this about Star Wars uh, for a oh sec. My, so oh my God. So buckle in, and if you haven't seen the most recent Star Wars, you might want to cover your ear holes now because I'm about to spoil uh, a, a small part of it, but it's still a, a pleasant surprise if you're a fan of the series. Uh, if you haven't seen it by now, you're not a Star Wars fan. Go out and see it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a scene with Grand Moff Tarkin, right? And, and ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, has gone through and digitally recreated him. And right. they, they had permission. He has no living relatives. They had to go out and get permission from his estate, and it was... Um, you know, because it was so, so well done, uh, and, and this is a whole nother discussion about how closely it skirts the uncanny valley. I know some people who thought, you know, he was real and some that didn't think he was real. And then there's another character in there, uh, that is digitally done that I will not spoil. Um, but then, then it was the same thing with that. They, they didn't know if it was real or fake or what. So, um, but yeah, this whole issue of of what happens with your body and your data after you die is um, is really interesting uh, because there's a lot of debate about it right now, and I'm sure lawyers uh, will get all over this and put clauses in legal documents that say yes, you can have my data, um, you know, and and it's just really interesting. And there is I there go a again. Way to do this, like you know how you can go to the DMV and donate your organs. Is there a way to actually donate? They use my data for medical science. Well, it was interesting in the article. It it was that there's a lot of proposals in the UK and in Germany trying to make that so this is an option. So it's almost like when you sign up for your driver's license and you check that box about your organs, you could check for your data. But right mm-hmm. now, in most most areas, it's not. Um, and they're working to change either change the legal system so it's not like that 72 years of time. Like you can just you know, kind of how you would do in a, any kind of experiment. You make the person's name, you like strip it away from the data, and you just kind of like take everything else and throw it into your data set. Um, but right now, it's it's the ongoing battle of trying to figure out how to make this a possibility. Right. So confession time real quick about this, though. Just sure. real quick. I ne- I didn't check the box to give my bo- donate my organs to my dad. Oh, I'm me either. Terri- I'm really terrified that I'm going to end up in like one of those. I'm terrified of that fact. It, it, sorry, you cut out for a sec there. You're terrified of ending up in one of those what? CSI body farms that I saw oh, on TV. Oh, okay. okay. I'm afraid of that. I uh, <laughs> This reminds me of an argument I had about what, what people can legally do to your body after... Uh, after <laughs> were you part of this conversation billy i feel like you were i don't know but, uh you know, i think it's a slab somewhere 
you know what? It's a it's a it's a conversation for another time and place. Uh. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna sit here with my fear then. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, while so, Billy's sitting there with his fears, let's get on with the next story. Yes, show. let's do it. Let's do it. Get as far from this as we can. All right. So researchers have developed an improved type of electrode that is more durable, lasts longer in the body, and transmits a clearer, more, more from current state-of-the-art materials. This could allow for improved restoration of mobility after spinal cord accidents, as well as improved powered prosthetic limbs that's just too awesome so this yeah, is done yeah. this is done by a, a implantable brain chip that can record neural neuroelectrical signals and transmit them to receivers in the limb bypassing the damage and restoring movement so recently these researchers described in a in journal nature scientific reports Reports a critical improvement to the technology that could make it more durable, last longer in the body, and transmit clearer, stronger signals. So I, I just thought this was an incredible reach in science, but it was also awesome because we're getting closer to that kind of uh, putting chips in your brain to not only to help people in this case, but I mean that's getting closer to the brain the, interface, the holy grail of human brain interfaces. It's a level yeah. with me, guys. To level with you guys, how many years are we from cyborgs? Really, let's be honest here. Cyborgs, we already have them. Stuff at this, we're already there, right? Yeah, it it depends on how you define cyborgs because we are already there. Prosthetics themselves um, can be considered, you know, cybernetic enhancements. Well, yeah, but I meant like fully articulation. Like, I lose my arm, I can replace it with another arm. Oh, uh, you're talking like full. Full replication of whatever you want—a sweet robot arm. You want to get a sweet robot arm, but it's not going to be Terminator style. Oh well, then there's no point to it. I want sweet robot arm that I can crush in my enemies in my hey, hand. Really, gl- I'm so glad you mentioned Cyborg uh, because I just want to make a plug for our other podcast, Cyborg Relations Podcast, where we talk about this stuff as it pertains to the Star Wars universe. It's a once a month podcast in our. Uh, what our third episode will be coming out um, shortly after this episode drops. So uh, go check that out if you like what we're doing here and want to support us in other ways. Uh, we, we'd love if you do that. All right, so that now that that plug is over, a cyborg is a being with both organic and biomechatronic, wow, biomechatronic body parts. Uh-huh. Biomechatronic, that's a word? That's a word. Biometric. It sounds mechatronic. like an awesome word. Biometric. I, I know. Say it. I know. I also. I also have an uh, alternate fact. I'm sorry. Alternate definition here. Uh, cyborg is a fictional, <laughs> a fictional superhero appearing in the American comic books published by DC Comics. All right. That's what I, want. I want a cyborg. Cyborg. A double cyborg. Double cyborg all the way. All right. What's across the sky? All right. What's up next? No, really though. How many years do you think we are away from it, though? In Uh, your opinion. Oh God. Uh, hmm. I'm I'm still not what definition is. Are you talking about synthetic skin? Can they feel? And is it just being able to move? Just being able to fully articulate limb. Like if a piano player lost their arm in six months to eight months later, they can still play the piano with both arms. because the, the prosthetic is that good and precise. Mm, what, like 10, 15 years, maybe? Really? 10, 15 years? So in our lifetime. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking 10 years at a max. I think you'll see some really articulate limbs, like down to the finger movement type thing. I think it's I think it's coming. That's so cool. All right. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, now really what's up now. next? So epic. All right. So it is made available a version of an advanced virtual world for training autonomous drones, as well as other gadgets to move on their own. The club recreates conditions like shadows, reflections, and other potentially confusing real world conditions in a highly detailed, highly realistic virtual environment without the risk of the, of using the real thing. So Microsoft says that it hopes to help the, democratization, I don't know why I have a problem with that word, wow. of robotics with with the move, which will assist individuals, researchers, and companies with testing of systems that would otherwise 
resource intensive for them to do on their own. So props to Microsoft for making this an open source program. That's too dope because they're, yeah. they're saving people a lot of money. Only get them like the work a whole lot better as far as like virtual training. This you know is, the other thing though, all those people who make robotics and everybody who always yells that their robots aren't good enough, they can be like, all right, you try now. See how well you do. Yeah, <laughs> flying a drone is really hard. Uh, and this is basically like flight simulator for <laughs> for drones. That's yeah. Really cool. It, yeah. I mean, there's what not is, much more yeah. to say. That Yay for virtual environments making things possible. And, okay, real quick, though, what is GitHub? I've never heard of this. GitHub is an online repository for your code. Um, so basically like I create something and put it up on GitHub, you can branch it off and create your own thing on top of it. And then Mm -hmm. once you've created that thing, you merge it back in. It's, it's, a it's a source tree. If you've ever heard that kind of like a share, it's like a code sharing site. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. Silly way to fly. All right. Cool. Okay. Next up. All right. So. So this starts taking us down the road of weird stuff happening this week. Yay. So by, by now it seems safe to say that Doom can be played on any device a person wants. It's been adapted for printers, ATM machines, calculators, the Apple Touch Bar, and many other devices. But none Wait. of those devi- Yeah. What? Doom the video game Doom? Doom yeah, the video yeah. game Doom. Doom. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the old okay. pixelated version. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, but none of those devices have a 370 horsepower to send you careening down the road, honking like a maniac while you blow your blow demons back to hell. So a YouTuber by the name of Vexel uploaded a video tutorial showing that he claims to be to have a step-by-step guide to playing Doom on the console screen of a Porsche 911. <laughs> that would be mo- <laughs> so. This would be moderate moderately interesting on its own but he explains that you're playing actually using the car shifters horn accelerator and steering wheel steering wheel to control the game meaning you have to drive and play at the same time and there's a video AKA, there's, oh, oh yeah yeah there's a video of him actually doing this and i mean the user <laughs> the user experience of this is phenomenally bad because your physical space is not limited <laughs> Your your physical space is limited by your surroundings, and so if you actually tried to control this game, there's a good chance you will crash unless you're in an open uh, parking lot or something. You know, funny yes, enough, which he was. never played Doom. Never played Doom. You've never played oh, Doom? Bummer, bro. I've never played that game. That was the one game my mom said, nah, I don't feel comfortable with you playing that game. And I just, <laughs> just never played it. Never played Doom. I get Doom. it. But that's pretty dang cool. I didn't know it was on like everything. I want to know how it's on a printer. How do you do that on a printer? There are tons oh, of videos. Dude, yeah. You got to just they go like... check them out. I see another Doom video every week of somebody putting it on something else. It's all over. the. It was like one of those games in high school where it was on all the computer servers. And everybody <laughs> had. That's... Yeah. All right. That is so cool. All right. Yeah, what's I've up heard of people being able to put it on calculus. What's up next? Cool stuff. All right. So in a promotion for the Lego Batman movie, Siri will now respond as if you were the Lego version of the Dark Knight, as long as you get her attention with, hey, computer, or hey, pewter. Hey, pewter. (laughs) Hello, pewter. (laughs) Hey, computer. Oh, man. So feel free to issue your commands in your own voice. That Lego Batman imitation is completely optional, but definitely encouraged, as you both <laughs> showed you, a second ago. Did you guys hey. see this movie? <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Seen it it yet. Uh, it's it's forgettable. Um, but I I mean I liked it. I had a good time with it. I thought it was it was fun. Uh, but the next day I completely forgot I saw it. But uh, see that's the thing. Nick Rome has no childhood. But he's just so. <laughs> but cool. I love the Lego. Hey, he hates, t- he hates the Lego movie. To he be hates. fair, hey, hold on, that's not fair. To be fair, I loved the Lego he movie. <laughs> I loved the Lego movie. Uh, and uh-huh. how dare you say I have no childhood? I, 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 I host a Star Wars podcast, man. No child. Everybody has their vices. <laughs> and everyone has their thing. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is fun. Um, I don't have any Apple products, but I really want to try it. Hey, pewter. Uh, hey, just in Will Arnett's scratchy uh, Lego <laughs> Batman voice. 
So oh, I'm gonna have to try that on my phone. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. What was going? On. You know what? <laughs> anyway, for all our I, yeah, that's pretty cool. I dig that. All our listeners on iOS devices, just uh, put me next to your uh, iOS device, and uh, here we go. Hey, pewter. <laughs> play the and Lego. All Batman. of our listeners no. are now enraged that their phone is talking. <laughs> hey, pewter, play the Lego Batman theme song. Amazon subscribe. <laughs> all right, all right. We're almost done with these stories. What's up next? Oh wow, we're uh, wow. We got a lot of stories. All right, keep going. <laughs> all right. So we're going back to Germany. So a man in a Tesla Model S saw a Volkswagen Passat swerving erratically on the autobahn. I feel like that's a scary thing to see. Slamming against the guardrail multiple times. When he noticed that the person behind the wheel was unconscious, the Tesla driver sprang into action. Oh man, Munecker Mucker. All these German names, Blake. I'm paper. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm loving the German. it. German. I'll be speaking German by the end of the podcast. So reports, right. reports from this newspaper said that this action involved a 41-year-old man in his Tesla calling the fire department and then literally pulling his Model S out in front of an out-of-control Passat. But to then save the driver the took over and actually moved it out yeah. of the man careened off the end of the cliff. He the real MVP. <laughs> and uh, good guy Elon, he uh, repaired that guy's Tesla for free. Oh, that's nice of Elon Musk. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was pretty nice. It even stand that compact on the autobahn because people drive fast on that shit i'm, su- anyway. I'm surprised with the fact that, oh go ahead well i mean you think about it though it's probably slammed in some guardrails a few times slowing it down yeah i mean i don't know if the gas was compressed on it but on the other side of that too that's pretty awesome that a tesla was able to actually he was able to do all these things on the tesla without probably ever looking at his phone the Tesla just oh, engaged yeah. in automatic save mode, and then uh, yeah, save super the driver, drunk mode, right? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Elon Musk is either the coolest inventor we've ever had, or he's secretly a supervillain. I, I don't know which yet. Yeah, I don't. Mm, yeah, that's I mean, a tough Elon one. Musk sounds like a Bond villain, honestly. <laughs> Mister Bond, I see you're driving a Tesla. <laughs> Jokes on you. <laughs> 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 you have fueled my evil empire. <laughs> okay, okay. What's up next? Another drone story. All right, go. Oh yeah. So Nick, this one's like super making your one of your predictions come true. Oh, so yeah. a growing number of companies are looking at the viability of air autonomous taxis as a way to ease urban and transportation woes. But the city of Dubai, from everybody, would land a, a passenger carrying the is. No. Nope. Billy, you said nope. You know what? <laughs> nope, nope. Not getting an automated drone in Dubai. What's going to happen there? I'm going to fall off. It's, <laughs> it, it's pretty scary. But it was Uber is first. Probably a good choice. But transportation agency and the Warman Summit and the operating passenger <laughs> service along predetermined routes in July. Whoa. You see, hang on for a quad open electric drone to carry people through the air. That's pretty Well, it looks like, uh, well, be the only one to actually take the distance of 31 miles. <laughs> yes. He will be the first. <laughs> uh, so there are no, some limitations. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Even the cargo idea, it's like, man, I'm going to get killed by an Amazon package falling on my head. I know what's going to happen. Looking at the design, it doesn't look that more in Ganelica. Right. It's just more compact. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a one person quadcopter. That's yeah. much what it looks like. That's a video I can't today. this looks fake or or but they have a video of it flying through the city of Dubai. Man, there's droning on and on. Yeah, and these on. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Man, I'm that with theme stories in here. Uh a reminder <laughs> to all of our listeners, if you want to check out these stories, we always post our show notes on Facebook. So go over there, give us a like, and check out all these news stories. You can follow the links and see all the videos and fun stuff that we're talking about there. Okay, Blake, what's up next? All right, so Dubai might be getting the first batch of anonymous passenger drones this summer, but hover surf, a, Rus- a Russian surf filled the sky with fully manned hover bikes. Oh, my the God, ca- this is how Putin's going to get us. <laughs> <laughs> the human an impressive single seat aircraft that not only has the capacity to lift you up into the sky but also puts puts the controls right in your own hands that's that's just too scary so the fully manned scorpion 3 fundamentally combines the standard motorcycle design with futuristic quadcopter 
tech quadcopter quadcopter technology to offer this the speed agility and stability of flight flight to the everyman so while while the hover surface airborne vessel is currently mostly seen as an extreme sports instrument the company hopes that its invention will realize its full transportation looks just too easy for me to even want to get on especially since it's airborne i uh my my first my first question is what's the weight limit because i want one of these uh you just want to one step closer to your dream of having your own speeder bike. Yes, it? yes, yes. That's exactly right. Um, this Everyone one it looks like, yeah. You know what though? This one actually looks more dangerous than the other one because the blades are exposed. <laughs> They're like cutting really close to the guy. Uh, and this one got it floating in a warehouse, uh, and it just looks um, like uh, like one wrong move and uh, his leg chopped off. <laughs> in all fairness, though, a motorcycle will probably do that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have either of you got a motorcycle before? Oh yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's bad news. I used to motorcycle and and do the lane splitting, uh, which is legal in California. So before you get on my case, uh, <laughs> it is legal here. But ooh, we were gonna give, we were gonna actually shake our fingers at you and go ooh. Uh, it is incredible. Um, probably won't go back to this thing. And I'm to get my motorcycle license. Yeah, they hard to do. That. Are we close yeah, to being done here? Others. We got two more, right? We got two more. Two more we stories? got two more. All right, let's get through them. All right. All right. So a London hospital is using VR to make medical testing more comfortable for children. So King's College Hospital teamed up with one of the hospital's play specialists to create an app that, when worn before an MRI, helps kids understand the procedure through an immersive VR experience. children to feel as though they are inside an MRI scanner and experience what it will be like on the day. So children have the opportunity to get accustomed to the loud tapping noises that happen during the scan, as well as learning that they need to keep still during duration of the scan. And this uh, this MRI app is actually available through Android. You know what? Our, uh, what? our long-standing history of saying, this is cool, be damned, because this is cool. This is awesome. <laughs> this is It awesome. really is. Yeah. I, this is kind of like our last story where the guy was under virtual reality for um, surgeries that are there, right? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Last week. Replacing anesthetic. Yeah. Except this is, uh, yeah, this is helping children. There's a lot of medical applications for virtual reality uh, coming Which out. Which is not yeah, I never something really thought I about. like thought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't think of it. That is pretty cool. Yeah. I'm, I really I really appreciate virtual reality as a tool and people just pushing the boundaries about like what you can do with it. Um I, it just blows my mind. It, it, yeah, not just for games, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, an MRI machine could be pretty freaky. I remember when I was a little kid, they took us on a field trip to a hospital to see all this stuff, and I looked inside that MRI machine. And that I bet that could be really freaky, freaky, especially when you're sick and injured and stuff like that, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a scary thing for sure. Um, Speaking of scary things. Yeah. All right, Segway King, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so, if, so if you're traveling through the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, you will for su- you, be prepared for some invasive new biometric security measures. This is too much Big Brother for me. <laughs> so following terrorist attacks on the European capital, Hang delays on, really, in airport security have doubled. Really quick, are these real terrorist attacks or fake ones? Sorry, okay, Bro, I'm um, sorry, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm hey, sorry. hey, let's not talk about the Bowling Green... That's right. That's so right. So lightly. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Keep going. Keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good. Uh, Group de ADP. I'm not really sure what ADP is here. But anyway, who operates Paris airports is testing the new software in Charles de Gaulle in an attempt to cut down on these on these times. Interesting. So this software from a company called Vision Box will check your password image against your face. Only visitors from the European Union countries currently have this option. Bloomberg says that the move comes as airports worldwide are rushing to tap digital technologies, including biometric recognition, to speed passengers through airports. So what does this mean for traveler travelers? Your wait times will be shorter, but your face and presumably all of your other travel details will be scanned and could be recorded. I would change that could be to will be will be. Yeah, and then you'll get targeted yeah. ads with your face in the ad saying how cool you could be, <laughs> and then you have a minority yeah. report thing. You could oh. really use this moisturizer for your face. By the <laughs> way, 
Uh, group ADP is the group of Airport de Paris. It's kind of like the FAA. Ah, Airport de Paris. The cool. Paris. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Ah, but yeah. You ended on a scary I, one. I yeah, this is like somewhere between you. scary and cool. Did this. I already thought they did this. Like, I just Me- figured that I was on a billion different cameras when I was in the airport. I mean, like, you I are, but now, now they're actually attaching data to it, I think, and, and running that data through um, algorithms to, uh, you know, help with this stuff. Well, I mean, is that so? I mean, like, think about it, though. We're pulling people willy-nilly, and there's tons of stories in the U.S. about people having these problems. And, you know, there are alternatives to taking a plane, you know? International travel is a little bit different, but, you know, you don't have to travel internationally. It's not like it's a have to, like, you know, it's on every street corner. It's in one building. Does that make sense? What if you're traveling for business, though? I mean... Well, if you're traveling for business and it's your job to be in that airport, then there are certain understandings that you make. Like, for example, you're going to be away from your family. You're going to ha- be scrutinized under security. And there's also options for people to actually bypass security measures. Like, um, oh, what was it? They just introduced it in the U.S. It's like pre-check security type of thing. It's like oh, yeah. 200 bucks. If and you're they a have trusted to, traveler or something. Everything. Yeah. I mean, like, business-wise, that's understandable. You took the job. You don't have to take the job. It doesn't usually mean you're going to be unemployed if you have the type of skills that people will send you all over the world to do something does that make sense yeah you know this this last one's kind of bumming me out though i don't want to i don't want to end on a sad note so you know what that's <laughs> i'm gonna call that it's gonna be it for human factors news this week let's switch gears a little bit and play a game uh we're gonna play <laughs> human <laughs> i know right we're gonna play human Segway factors I, i'm trying i'm trying uh we're gonna play human factors 20 questions now, this is a game where I have sourced a topic from one of our listeners, and that listener... Oh, crap. I had it up here. Hang on. Uh, Monster. I know. Shoot. I usually put them in the show notes. Looks like Charles P. Charles P. from Indiana has... Uh, has <laughs> Sorry, Charles. Uh, <laughs> so, Charles P. has uh, suggested this week's topic... This is where you guys have to guess what Charles P. has submitted to us. And uh, let's go ahead and start. Let's at it this time. Oh, yeah. Sure. This is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Did I lose you guys? Oh, no. I haven't heard what the... Oh, wait, yeah. Um, oh, crap. No, I forgot how this started now. <laughs> so you guys ask questions. Right, right, right. All right. So, Billy, I'm going to let you hit the first question because I did it last time. I want to follow your... your... All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, is it a person? No. Damn, it's never... Uh, All right. So, or is it design oriented? Oh, that's too general, dude. Everything's design oriented. You guys taught me that. Do you, you do you want to use that question, or do you want to take Billy's advice, or? Good. All right, do it. Um. Oriented. D- design oriented. Uh, be more specific. Is it a theory? No. Hmm. Is it a, not a theory? It's not a person. Is it? Ooh. Uh. It's a theory is it um oh crud i just don't know um well what are you guys thinking okay so so you know it's not a theory you know it's not a person what other way can you narrow this down 
Is it a tool used in computers? Like yes. A, it's a tool. Is it a computer? No. <laughs> is it a methodology? Yes. Oh. Is it the is it heuristics? Yes. Wow. Six questions. Heuristic evaluation by Charles P. Yeah. That was close enough that I'd Look give it. it to you. I mean, you would have got I, it. You would have got it. Oh, though, so I don't know if that was easy or not. <laughs> well, we we asked it for easy works. ones. Yeah, well, we. Matters. I know, I know. That was that was really good. That was really good. You guys, you guys did fantastic on that one. <laughs> I'm blown away. Go, Blake. Six. <laughs> Billy, you were the one that guessed it, man. Yeah, but Blake inspired me. Right. Well, I mean, you guys got I'm it. I'm the muse. That's. I mean, that's the great part. I mean, Charles, that was a great one, man. Bring Thank it back you, next week. Uh, that's, uh, where am I? <laughs> it's a long day, everyone. That's it for today. If you have any suggestions for topics, games, or news star- stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us on all the social media. You can head on to our Human Factors Cast Facebook site, comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at HFactorsPodcast on Twitter, or send us an email at HumanFactorsCast at gmail.com, like Charles P. did today. Uh, leave us a voicemail. Our voicemail, our voicemail line is 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you like what we're doing, we always like it when you guys support us monetarily. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Whatever you do, just make those reviews good. We like to hear your feedback, but we only want to read the good stuff. So don't come here if you got anything negative to say. I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? Oh, you can find me hanging out on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Don't Panic UX. That one. Oh, yeah. That is a new one. Don't panic, UX. All right, and Billy Hall, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at Comstar Cleric. That's that, a classic. <laughs> that's a classic. That one's not changing. As for me, I'm pretty classic, too. I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cat. Till next time. It depends. 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 <laughs> it depends and stuff. It depends. It depends.